Hey, everybody. What is happening? I hope you're having a great day. Um, look, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this show is dropping on Friday, so hopefully you've had a great productive week. You're, you know, this is December, man. So hopefully you're you're planning out what you're going to do for 2016. Now, look, today's, you know, commonly um, you'll hear me say we're doing something a little bit different. Remember, you know how I do that? Well, today we are. Today we brought on the show. Um, this guy is really an investor type guy. Okay, real estate investor. Um, and I brought him on for a couple things. One, I think it's good for you guys to hear a different perspective on real estate. Uh, and, uh, he, this guy's a pretty smart guy. Uh, but two, um, this is something I talk about on the show. Okay. Most real estate agents. Now this is most, maybe not you, but most real estate agents never, ever buy another piece of property except for the one that they live in. That's it. And, and, you know, you as a real estate agent, um, you know, you guys see deals and, you know, what we talk about on the show is we talk about how, you know, with real estate, it is the only industry, unlike stocks or something where insider trading is legal. And what I mean by that is, you know, you get insider information on if there's a divorce, if there's a death, you know, uh, you know, changes in life, you know, what somebody really, really wants or needs for the property. You guys know that stuff. And so when you hear it, you know, I commonly, man, um, uh, you know, whether it's from people I coach or talk to or whatever, you know, they'll tell me about a deal. They're like, oh, this fourplex, um, you know, was going to sell for 180 grand and I know I can get 320 for it. And I'm like, why aren't you going to buy it? Um, and then the common thing that I'll hear is, well, I don't have the cash, you know? And then the next thing I say is, look, I'll, I'll give you the cash, you know? I mean, so, so we talk about, okay, let's get into what we're talking, we talk about here. Now we talk a lot about macroeconomics and, and, you know, when you hear it, you'll recognize what we're talking about. Um, we talk about where you can find opportunity and what I mean by opportunity when I say that is, you know, where is it, where can you find opportunity in residential versus commercial? Where can you find opportunity across the country? Uh, we also talk about how to look for opportunity. Um, we also talk about fundraising. And this goes back to that, that opportunity that you see that you can't buy. You know there's $120,000, $140,000 of equity in that deal, but you don't happen to have the cash. That's okay. Money is everywhere. You can go raise the capital. Um, so we talk about how to raise capital, the importance of th the the skill of being able to raise capital. Um, and once you, and 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 if you guys can think about this, you know, raising capital, learn that skill. What you can do is in your real estate business, you can add a layer of wholesaling into it. And what what that means is you find that that property that that is. 20, 40, 60, a hundred thousand dollars under market. Okay. And again, maybe you only come across one or two of these a year. Maybe you come across one every two years. It doesn't matter. You're going to come across them. So when you find a property that is clearly under market, all you have to do is write a contract, get it under contract, and then you can go raise the money. So if there is fifty thousand dollars in equity there, but you don't have the two, three hundred thousand dollars you need to buy it. Well, put it in a contract. You can come to me and say, I'll say the contract. I just want 20 grand, 10 grand of that equity. And guess what? If I can, if I can write a check and flip a quick property and make 40, 50 grand, I'll do it. Uh, and, it's, and it's not only me. There's lots of people who, who have c capital that want to make a return. All right. Um, we talk about the importance of relationships. Now, I'll, and you might go, yeah, Toby, that's, that's pretty big basic. That's pretty self-explanatory. But, you know, real estate's a unique and it, it's something I think important to recognize how important relationships are um, and how many relationships it takes to get one deal done in real estate. Uh, we talk about prospecting. We talk about building your list. There's a lot of stuff we talk about here. This is one that I think uh, you might listen to the first time and go, yeah, pretty good. Uh, but when you listen to it again, you're going to go, yeah, there's a lot there. So I hope you like it. Um, really quickly, uh, I got to tell you, if you've left a real estate, I'm sorry, uh, uh, an iTunes review recently, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I just looked at them. We've gotten some great ones. Uh, really, really. Um, let, me, let, me just, let me just give some of these people some shout outs. 
Um, a massive 45. It's a, this is a necessary tool. Uh, Biamba, number one, the best podcast, real estate podcast ever. Powerful wit, invaluable service. Uh, Beer Man, I can't express how great the show is. One dot Francilis. Uh, Toby somehow gets these huge names in real estate. Uh, Hawk212, I love Toby's questions. Thanks, man. Um, LM. Eli M. C. Neely, I don't know, Camera Shrimp, Toby, hit it on the mark, uh, Los Tigres del Norte, uh, Frat Star 578, uh, GGBBDXBN, content's great, uh, Raz Vedek Chick, what are these crazy names, guys, <laughs> what are these crazy names for, uh, Trevor Jones, I'm a d- broker with a degree in business and real estate, um, I, I will learn in any two episodes of Super Agents, I get more education than all of my schooling combined. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Trev. TJ. Um, Real Estate Brevard. Uh, Jay Flair. Marianne Bacol Uba. Uh, TC Realtor. JL51015. Awesome show. Thanks, guys. Uh, Randy Farrow. Um, Savvy T101P. Uh, Mikila. Uh, Keek L. Why are these crazy names? Kick LST71. Thanks, guys. Listen to what he says. Um, Ely, my agent. Um, James Basla. I think I just merged your name, James. Eric Carey. This is my weekly podcast. I know, Eric. Uh, GMAC444. Uh, Mar- Martel buys houses. Always golden nuggets in every show. Mark Rickert. Um, Toby and his style of interviewing makes a podcast. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Wise Sin. Favorite real estate show. Matt Curtis. Uh, real estate just found the show. Great content. Now, Matt Curtis, I got to tell you, Matt Curtis is a, a, a client of ours on real estate radio experts. This guy is doing about 350 deals a year. Uh, we should get him on the show. He doesn't, he doesn't like his voice, but, uh, uh, but he's killing it, man. We put him on, we put him on radio and, uh, literally the first week he put him on, on Monday, Monday, Tuesday aired spots by Wednesday morning, 9am. He had three appointments. So, uh, Hey Matt, thanks for being part of our team. Uh, S G S Gabrielli. Um, you're the average of the five people you hang out with. This podcast is, helps me, validates me, educates me, motivates me. Um, Matteo807 just stumbled onto it. Love it. Walesco, Marco65. This guy's an idiot. L- l- sorry. Marco65. Let me tell you, I, all of my reviews are five stars. I appreciate that. Marco65. This is, this, uh, this is worthwhile listening to, guys. Okay. This guy, Marco65. My 13, here's what he says. Jack of all trades, master of none, lots of buzzwords thrown around here, no real substance. Let me tell you why this guy's an idiot. My 13-year-old wanted an iPhone 6, okay? She wanted an iPhone 6S. I said, you don't need to spend $750. You know, I'll buy you a used uh, 6. Um, that's all you need, right? She's, the, you know, and I, don't, I think she can deal with, she's dealing with an iPhone 4S right now. But she wants an iPhone 6. All right, you're 13 years old. That's what, so here's what I told her. Here's the deal. I said, listen, <clears throat> it's going to cost me about 450 bucks to buy the iPhone. I said, here's the deal. If you go out and make on your own 100 bucks in 30 days, I will buy you the phone. You go make 100 bucks in 30 days, I'll buy you the phone. Is that a deal? That's a deal. I wrote, we wrote up a contract. I signed it. She was all happy, okay? So the first thing she does is she goes and she tries to wrangle her little brothers, charging her them. Her little brothers are 7 and 11. Their rooms are filthy. They, I mean, the house cleaner will clump, come on Tuesday, on Wednesday. There's clothes all over the floor, especially the 7-year-old. So, so she wrangles the 7-year-old and says, Do you, let me, I'll clean your room for you because I'm always saying, hey, pick up your room. I'll clean your room for you. And the seven-year-old's like, fine, how much? And she goes, 15 bucks. And I found out about this afterwards. So she charged, good for her, little entrepreneur, but she charged her little seven-year-old brother $15 to pick up the floors, the clothes off his floor. So I couldn't take that away from her because she did the work. But I said, listen, that's not the deal. You have to go earn $100, and now $85, outside of family. So, so then she kind of went around my back and talked to grandma and got some work from grandma. And she's like, well, that's like, that's out of our house. And I said, okay, fine. You can keep the money, but you got to earn it from people that you're not related to. You got to go out. You got to be an entrepreneur. You got to find new customers, 
somewhere else. So she, you know, so I said, hey, you know, she's a great drawer. So I said, hey, you know, let's sign you up on Fiverr. She got some gigs on Fiverr. Um, literally within one day, she made like 10 bucks drawing dragons for um, some one girl in Italy. Or no, no, drawing chickens and, and dragons uh, out of the country. So she made some money. And then, you know, she's all upset. She can't find any work to do. So she's like, oh, I'll sell candy at school. So, you know, mom takes her to Costco, buys the big $13 four-pound bag of, of uh, you know, chocolates. And she, you know, she I said, count them up and, you know, and do the math, and you know you should get, at least get a two X return out of that. So she's doing that. But I, so anyhow, sorry, this guy Mark. But when I got the phone, the battery wouldn't hold the charge. Um, the, I wish I could tell you this guy's full name. Um, the guy's an idiot. So so I said, hey man, let me return the phone. Literally like day two, let me return the phone. The the the, the battery doesn't hold charge. Um, he said, no 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 no. And finally, I just said, "Listen, you know, I'm going to I'm going to eBay, um, and and I'm gonna, you know, I, I need to return it." Um, so eBay said, "You got to return it," and then and then uh, and then he threw a fit, and then I went to AIM American Express. I said, "Listen, I'm just trying to return this thing. Just cancel this, you know, put it on hold." Um, this guy, this guy got so mad. He he said, "You messed with the wrong guy this time." Like like he's you know I don't know if you ever watched Nacho Libre. You messed with the wrong guy this time. So so he said, "You messed with the wrong guy this time." The guy wrote a letter to the Better Business Bureau and said that that I was committing uh, uh, credit card fraud because I ordered it on my business account, which I didn't, um, and then I canceled it. So I get a letter from the Better Business Bureau. Bureau. Then he writes a letter to the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, because he said that um, uh, I was committing credit card fraud because I, I, I because I wanted to return his phone. Um, and now the guy the guy finds my podcast and leaves me a one star review. Now the whole I'm I'm telling you that guys because be careful who you do business with. You as a real estate agent, you honestly. Like, you, you know, you need to have an A-plus rating with a, with a better business bureau. You don't need somebody giving you bad Zillow reviews or Yelp reviews or, or anything because of some petty, petty person. So um, that's my little tid- tidbit. All right. So Marco65 uh, says, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, he should look at my bank account. Um, the Real Roz1. Uh, fantastic, Dan. Bro, most insightful, Joe G313. All right, guys, I know that's been long in, a long intro. I appreciate you sticking through it. Let's get to the show. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents have built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Today on the show, we're doing something a little bit different. Um, today's guest is uh, is a professional real estate investor. That's what he does. He also teaches people how to find deals, raise capital uh, for real estate investments. He also has an award-winning podcast that I've been on called Cashflow Diary. Practice what you teach. I'm thrilled to welcome my buddy, Jay Massey. Hey, Jay, thanks for taking the time out, man. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So listen, Jay, give the audience a brief over. I know you have a really rich and varied background, but maybe give people a sense of who you are, uh, and then we'll get into what you do. Sure, sure. Um, Father of four children, husband of one wife. That's (laughs) typically how that starts. Uh, And the oldest is in college uh, Uh now, and the youngest just started uh, preschool, mm. which or, or kindergarten, one of the two. I don't know. I forget which, but he's all excited about it. Either way it goes, uh, three girls, one boy, uh, military kid. So I grew up in many different countries on the way, mostly in Germany. Mm. And uh, I've, I've <laughs> so don't ask me anything about the 1980s, by the way. I won't know the answer uh, because I was in Germany and that's just, you know, a little bit of trivia. So if I'm ever in a game of Trivial Pursuit, I'm not the guy. Well, I mean, so, but I mean, were you there when the wall came down? That, yeah, that right after that or right during that process is exactly when we left. So that's when we came, finally came back to the U.S. So I did get to visit what was then 
the Eastern Europe, uh, East Germany, Czechoslovakia. I've seen some things <laughs> that I would that that I think many kids today should be exposed to, but obviously can't be. So, so how how did you trans? You know, so you're a military. I mean, it, it's funny that. To me, Jay, that, you know, you grew up as a military kid, right? So military mm-hmm. people are, uh, you know, very structured in the way they live and what they do, right? You're in the military. <laughs> uh, and now, I mean, like, and then you migrate to this thing where there's no rules um, at right. all. I mean, not, and that is right. not only just being an entrepreneur, but now you're, you're messing with real estate. How did you, from growing up in the age, how old are you, Jay? I am 40. Oh, you're 40. You're, I'm 45, man. You're younger than me. Um, so, so how, where did you learn your craft? How did you, how did you go from, again, being, you know, not, not even us based now us doing real estate. How did you, how did you get, <laughs> what, how did you learn yeah. what you do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. It, it's, I think any craft, if anyone breaks it down, uh, takes little bits and pieces. It's an amalgamation of a lot of things that I've done in the past. And I think that's true for anyone who does anything. You know, there's a, I, at first you, you just started, you know, for me, I started selling stuff. I've done door to door. I've done carpet. I've done yellow page ads. I've done the network marketing. I've done lots of sales, mm. uh, just pure. And I've done the inside sales. I've done the phone sales. I've done the cold calling. I've done all of those things. So that was just, you know, a piece, a chapter, but that's just only one part of the skill set. And then for a time I, I started competing in, in professional speaking competitions and that was for a time. And then there was a time when I was, I thought I was going to be an actor <laughs> model. Sorry. I, I chuckle, but you get the point. And all of those skill sets required specialized training in each of those things, but they, they come up to being who I am today. But when you talk about the military upbringing, what it does provide is exposure to a bunch of different cultures, a bunch of different people, and understanding the need for relationships, which is the foundation of real estate. I, and I think I've come to this realization recently. Many people have trouble getting started in, rela- in real estate specifically because it's one of the businesses that requires the most number of relationships to actually execute one transaction. That's the challenge. With many other businesses, you don't need nearly as many relationships to actually get your product or service on the market and get it sold. When it comes to real estate, that's a completely different story. Okay, that's interesting because because uh, that's an interesting notion. And I would agree with you, but I think that um, – tell me your idea on this. And I, I'm going to see if I can articulate this for you, Jay. I have – I'm a, for me. I'm a I'm a, a relatively private guy. However, I have yeah. tons of relationships now. Most, in, in, especially in business, the way that I treat my relationships, for better or for worse, they're transactional relationships, and I have no problems with 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 having those kinds of transactional relationships. Um, do do you see? It, it, how, how do you view that relationships versus those just transactional relationships, if that's clear at all to you? Yeah, it, well, it, it's clear. It's just that when I was in the more buy and sell world, mm-hmm. that was very true of a lot of the relationships that I had or needed as well. Uh, I just don't do as much buy and sell as I do as buy, rehab, and hold these days. So the the difference is I, I know that I'm going to be in a relationship. So uh, say, for example, one of we have a relationship with uh, T-Mobile. They're a, cell, they're a tenant, and one of, we have one of their cell phone towers on our property. That's a long-term, multi-year relationship. Same thing uh, with a lot of our tenants. Same thing when you have lending partners who are going to be there or private capital who wants to build cash flow. All of these things require long-term relationships. And, and uh, trust me, we, we also have a 182-unit building. That You're not going to go through – that's a long contractual relationship with your rehab people, contractors, maintenance, et cetera, in order to pull that off. You, you, you just have to, by default, have longer relationships to, to make all those things work. So I, it depends on the type of business you're in. When I was wholesaling and that was like the major source of our income – uh, yeah, you know, it was in and it was out, it was in and it was out and over, but I still tried to make them long-term relationships by having people who had more than one property. So if I knew you had, you know, one property or 10 properties, I wanted to deal with the person with 10 because that 
I, you know, I build one relationship once and then I have, you know, 10 individual transactions from that. Yeah. So, and I'm very much like you, I, I'm not, I'm naturally introverted and shy. I'm not the best at initiating relationships, um, or, or repairing them for that matter when they get broken. Yeah. But it, what it comes down to is I have to learn certain abilities in order to have the business grow. And just because I'm not the best at starting them doesn't mean that I can't find techniques in the marketplace, especially today, where I attract people to me, which is what we've become very good at. So, so how, how, how do you do that, Jay? How, how does somebody become – and I think that's a fascinating topic because I think as salespeople, most people, the, the standard – old kind of rules that we've all been taught mm-hmm. is chase, 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 never say right. no, right? Just keep, right. J- just, just keep pounding these people, you know, like, like you're on the African Savannah, right? You're just chasing, you know, the, you're the cheetah <laughs> chasing that gazelle down. Um, how, how do you, Jay, think about that pull ver- or push versus pull or, you know, or track versus chase? Yeah, well, and again, there's a time to chase, so to speak, as you're saying it, but the question is, is what you're chasing and what stage of relationship is that person with you? That, that's what's missing from most people when they say chase. When they say chase, they're usually chasing a, a very cold relationship. So mm-hmm. for, for our perspective, first, uh, let me, and I'll also remind me to tell you there was this one technique that I use, and, I, and I'll give it to everybody. I want them to go use it because they'll be able to. Uh, attract more people to them. Now, it'll take absolute, complete humility in order to pull it off, Because, but if you pull it off, you will attract leads to you every day consistently for a very, very long time, every day you do it. So I will definitely share that. But the thing that it comes down to is that when it when you're chasing, you sh- if you need to create an inbound uh, set of relationships or business, et cetera, you should be sending that information to individuals who already know, like, or trust you in your database in some way. And that's the issue is that very few businesses or small business owners or real estate agents, real estate investors, especially they fail. We fail to build a database mm-hmm. of people who even have an interest in real estate. That's all I'm asking. Build a database of people who have an interest in, in, in real estate. Once you have that, and you quote unquote feel the need to chase your chasing is, is, is as difficult as sending out a, a, a text message or sending out an email today that says, Hey, um, yeah, where, and typically what I'm teaching people is to ask for a referral. Hey, if you know anyone who would like to receive a, you know, similar service to what you've done or what you've done with us, or if you know anyone who was looking to sell a house or buy a house or sell an apartment building or use their retirement, in my case, I'm always saying use their retirement plan, uh, to invest for positive cash flow. Um, do you have anyone that you would refer them to? And if not, please mm-hmm. choose us. Yeah. And when you send that information out to people who at least are already familiar with you, you're going to get an influx of calls and, and requests more than you can possibly handle. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think I think the other way that – that you know, I think there's so much gold in your own database, right? Number one, you have mm-hmm. to build it. But I think you know, even mm-hmm. when I think people if people come to me and go, Toby, hey, listen, I, I need I need a new account. I need a new I need to hire somebody. How do I go about doing that? Do I go and post on Monster? I'm like, you, ask no. your friends, man. Like, yeah, just yeah, send no. that out to your database. It's crazy, right. you know. Use them. Right. Um, so, so, um, do, uh, have you ever had Michael Mayer in your show? Seven levels of communication. I have does not sound does not ring a bell. You no. need, you should get that guy on your show, man. That's all he, all he talks about is how to build. He's written a book on it, and it's especially for real estate. So how in terms of tapping that database and sending that email out? Hey, you know, do you know anybody that's you know re- retirement? Blah blah blah. Are do you do it in sort of a a, a, a a direct ask, or are you doing it very lightly? Uh, depends uh, okay. on the need and the urgency. So in general, anyone in our database, uh, we produce six pieces of content a week. So what, three videos, two uh, audio podcasts, and one written article. So, and those are just it's 100% content, period. So by the time we've actually asked for something, <laughs> uh, it's, not, it, it's like you know, we've given so, so many more ideas and tips and tricks on how to grow your business and make things happen that it's not really that big of an ask, so to speak. 
Um, and we primarily do it in one of two ways, either on the right hand side or the bottom uh, of our, our a page on our website or on, on an article or just at the bottom of an email that's usually preceded with some sort of content. Now, that's the soft way of doing it. When we're direct, it's an email that is directly asking for those types of things. Uh, but those probably, I'd say, go out maybe once, twice a month at this particular moment, if that. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, that's uh, that's great. I mean, that's this is this is uh, uh, Vaynerchuk's jab, 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 right hook, right? Give, 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 and then ask. And it's you know, when when you do that, it's not really mm-hmm. an ask. So, just in terms of tapping your database, um, you create six pieces of content a week. I mean, do, how often do you send out emails to your database? Uh, two emails, two emails, uh, one on Wednesdays, one on Fridays. So the Wednesday email uh, says, here's the new article, and oh, by the way, here's some videos you may have missed. And then Friday is, here's the, uh, here's the videos, and here's some podcasts you may have missed. So that way everybody knows about both or all the mediums with which we try to communicate. That is so great, man. That is really great. Now, have you – I'm sure you being the smart guy that you are – so Wednesdays and Fridays, have you A-B tested this? I mean, have you tried sending it out on Saturday? I mean, have, is that is – right. there, is there a reason that you send out – do you get higher open rates on Wednesdays and Fridays? Yeah, yes. Uh, at the end, it, what, it, what happened for us was it turned out the, the reason Wednesday and Friday originally got chosen – was we were looking at uh, our podcast downloads. We were looking at when they were going up and down and spiking and falling. Mm. And we noticed that when we sent out uh, communications on Wednesdays and Fridays specifically, it leveled out throughout the entire week. So we were seeing really, really massive you know, spikes during the beginning of the week, and then we, it just would drop off. And the same thing with uh, emails, opens, and clicks, et cetera. So uh, Wednesdays and Fridays are have been very, very good to us. Probably the only other better day is a Tuesday <laughs> in terms of sending out information. Um, so Wednesdays and Fridays, though, tend to work for us. But Tuesdays for our, is usually when, for our members, we do our live Q&As. And I'll, let me give you just another data point that you can you can acknowledge, throw away, or whatever. So, so you sure. may or may not know, we have, uh, as part of our podcast, we have a radio advertising arm. When I say radio, this is get in your car, AM, FM radio. It's called Real Estate Radio Experts. So we go okay. out as an agency and we buy commercial airtime for our clients. Now, here's the deal, Jay. What we found by tracking, uh, uh, we found that Wednesdays, is the worst time to do a radio spot. So typically when we buy radio, we'll mm-hmm, buy Monday, mm-hmm. Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So it's interesting that, that your, your database, uh, that's a bad day for us. And uh, again, two different mediums, two different things. But, but again, right. just, just – uh, Well, it kind of makes sense if you think about it, uh, it because one is a, a persistent medium – and we're we're kind of filling in that space in the midweek where it, you know it's on demand. Yours is more of a push. If they're in the car, happen to be around that time, it it would make sense. You know, no one by the time Wednesday hit, everyone has decided what they're finally doing this week, right. and they're doing it. <laughs> and yeah. then Thursday comes around, it's like, hey, what are we going to do this weekend? Let's or let's begin to do some things and get in the car, et cetera. So yeah, it, it kind of makes sense a little bit. So, so you know, everybody, sh- as you said, Jay, everybody should have a database. You know, mandatory. Let, yeah, let's talk about list building. As sure. a, and again, so you know, my show is about entrepreneurship through the lens of a real estate agent. However, eighty percent of my listeners are real estate agents. How? What are what are some some strategies or tactics that that you can maybe pass along for list building? Um, at the end of the day, it's got to be something that you're going to be willing to, to do and or give away. But what it comes down to is give give a some simple solution to a problem, a, a simple solution to a problem. It's got to be consumable within, say, five to seven minutes uh, and easily downloadable. It's just got to be a very, very easy something for free, something that I have a problem with, something that they want. For example, um, if and I'm not a realtor, but if I was and I was marketing to realtors and I wanted more realtors on my list, I would say here are the here's a a I don't know seven point checklist that you need for every listing appointment, mm. and that that's going to begin to get realtors. Yeah, what are those seven things that I need for every listing appointment to guarantee I get the sale? All right, cool. Um, I don't know what those seven things are, by the way, but <laughs> whatever they are is is what I would begin to do, and I would put that in front of you know put that in front of where the marketplace would be. 
uh, wherever those realtors would be because that's going to be, that's going to solve a very, very specific problem. Now that tells me the only person who's going to do that is a realtor. No one else. You're not going to get a carpenter to download that because they don't care about that. Yeah. It's only a realtor. So I'm going to have a very hyper targeted list and then I'm going to serve them based upon that need that they came in, you know, whatever that might be. Got it. Okay. That's, that's good. That's really good, man. Um, that's really, really good. Okay. And I'm just going through some of your, your episodes, uh, as you, as you were talking, um, we know we have some people in common on our show. Um, so, so I would imagine, <laughs> so let's look, here's the thing, you know, I, th- it, it, we, as real estate agents, what I'm blown away is, is, and I, even some of the people I coach, you know, they come across great deals. However, yeah. Many, many times the only piece of real estate they ever buy is the house they live in. Um, and mm-hmm. I, it's just such a mistake because, you know, I, here's here's a line I'm sure you'll you'll uh, appreciate, Jay, is that real estate is the only industry where insider information is completely legal. <laughs> necessary. Not just <laughs> not, not not even legal, not just legal, but absolutely necessary. Are you kidding me? Yeah, well, I, again, so, you know, people find deals all the time and they don't, and, and I, you know, why didn't you buy that, right? I'll, I'll, and they'll say, well, I didn't have the cash. And I go, well, you can go raise it. So, so let's talk a little bit about, about finding deals and, and how, as an agent, you can capitalize, capitalize on those deals, even if maybe you don't have the, the cash in the bank. Sure. Well, and that's the, the challenge is it's twofold. One, it's a thought process. You have to elevate your thought process from I to we. And then second, it's as you are identifying, it's a marketing problem uh, at the end of the day. So many people that at least that, because I get the same thing, you know, people have, they, they've got all the pieces, but they don't know how to put the puzzle together. And they, they, there seems to be this attitude like, well, I want to do real estate, but I don't want to do sales or I don't want to, I'm like, well, real estate's still a business. For some reason, as soon as you say it's real estate, you forget standard business practices and principles still apply. And I, I've not been able to figure out that mystery. However, uh, that that's really what it comes down to. When you're taking down a deal uh, and you're, you say you don't have the money or the credit, okay, that's the I level of thinking. The we level of thinking is, well, how could we do this? Or who could uh, take advantage of this? If you're the wholesaler, you're not buying for you anyway. You were buying for your buyer's list. You were buying for the person who was ultimately going to have the money. So it, it matters not whether you have the capital or credit or resources to actually close or execute that deal. What matters is, do you have at least five people on your list who would be remotely interested in what you're looking at? And if so, then put it under contract. If you're going to keep it for yourself. Now, instead of being greedy and going, well, I don't have it so that I can get all the benefits. Well, what benefits do you have or what resources do you have that you could contribute when packaged and paired with somebody else together? Everyone could go and win if you were the one say in control and, and directing the ship. So when you elevate your thinking to that level, then suddenly you're now in the realm of possibility of being able to buy any piece of real estate on the planet. Yeah, I agree. And, I, and again, I think that I think that just even the simple notion that you're you're suggesting of, you know, you see a deal out in the marketplace, put it under contract. And uh, and, you know, I, I commonly say, look, money is everywhere. The deal yep. flow is the thing that's hard. If you can truly find a deal, you can find money for it. There's there's like that's money's easy, at least in my world. I agree. I'm not, I am going to agree with you that in fact, it's in everybody's world. Every person, human listening to this right now, regardless of country, you all have the same issue. We have an oversupply of fiat currency in the system and an undersupply of experience and expertise to go out there and mark and to have that be put to productive use. This is worldwide. If there wasn't an epidemic pandemic going on, this is what it is, is that there's too much money in the system and very few people relative to the amount of money know exactly what to do with it to put it to productive use. Yeah, so, so as somebody out there, you know, in, in let's just keep it the U.S., right? Somebody's out there in Boston, uh, Canada, <laughs> sure, sure. whatever, you know, they, they see a deal. Um, talk us through the steps. So they see a deal. They know that it's 20 percent, 30 percent under under value, under market. Right. So clearly there's an opportunity. Um, 
maybe just outline some of the steps that you would go through in, in capitalizing on that opportunity. Well, the, again, it's, I don't want to try to make it sound oversimplified, but if, if I am confirmed on my value, if I'm certain that that is under market, that that is, you know, a deal, as you say, then the next step is to get the thing under contract and secure it. I've got to secure my rights to it in, in the U.S., what we call equitable interest and in, in, with the determinable contract so that I know that I can and am the only potential buyer for that particular piece of real estate. Once I know that I am in that position, then the next thing is all about marketing to enough potential investors to either A, who I would sell it off to, or B, keep, uh, who I would raise the capital from in order to reposition the asset or take it down and put it in the portfolio. It's really that simple. You know, I agree with you. I agree with you. So, but I just wanted you to say it, uh, right? Because on this, you know, you're the authority on this. On this, so. But look, okay. So, so now, now I'm gonna I'm gonna put it on a contract. Now I can put it on a contract with my name, Jay Massey, or I can sure. put it on a contract with my LLC or, or corporation, right? Massey Industries. Sure. Um, sure. Should people be armed? with, you know, uh, um, a vehicle, a corporate vehicle, LLC in order, cause, because I, I, if there's a three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars piece of property, I don't need to sell it to one guy. I mean, I can put together a syndicate, right? I can have five people invest in this deal. Yeah. So I've, now we're just going to make it that much more complicated, but yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Well, hold it. So is that with you as a wholesale, do you typically go one-to-one, you find one deal and, and sell, sell the paper, uh, or, or, uh, explain this pro- for somebody who doesn't n- know if this is a foreign concept to a lot of people, Jay. Okay. Got it. So, so here's, here's how I'll do yeah. it. Here's how I'll do it. I, I'll use a very common technique of taking the known and bridging it with to the unknown. So it'll make more sense. Okay. Um, let's pretend for a second that you know of this small little company by the name of Apple. And what they do is they produce technology that you actually want to use and consume. Anytime they come out with a new version of it, a couple of things happen. One, people get excited. Two, a line forms to be the first ones or to have it in your general area. Outside the store, people camp out. Now, those lines, only because there's something of value on the other side inside that door, do they, that line, that position in line is now valuable. It's valuable because other people do not or choose not to use their time, efforts, and energy by sitting in that line to get that item, even though they still want it. And you have heard stories of individuals standing in line on behalf of other individuals so that everybody could have the new iPhone, Apple Watch, or whatever it is that they were making this week. This is the exact same thing, except and when you're standing in line, I'm calling that your escrow period. When the moment you get in line is when you put the property under contract. You don't need the money until the store opens and it's actually time when the cashier says that'll be forty nine ninety five, please. That's when you need the money and you have all that time to go find a replacement to stand in line. Some people do it, say, hey, look, you buy my iPhone, I'll stand in line for you. Some say, give me $50, I'll stand in line for you. Some say, hey, you know what, uh, for every iPhone you buy, I want $30 as a, as a fee. Some, you know, maybe they could, you can do this as creatively as you like. The point is, you can do the same thing with real estate. And when you realize that, you just go figure out what pieces of real estate everybody wants and then you go stand in line for it. <laughs> that's really that simple. Yep. No, no. And, and, and I think with, that's a great example, your Apple example. The, the other piece, though, with real estate, right, in the Apple situation, supply is virtually unlimited, right? There's some. Sure. But with, you know, with real estate, right, with the one deal, I mean, you're, it's, supply is finite. It's that one deal. And, I, and, I, and again, I, that's so valuable, I think, you explaining this to people, that this is, uh, you know, you could either do this full-time uh, or you could do it um, uh, as just as, a, as an add-on to your current uh, business. Um, where, where do you, now, I know, Jay, you do this across the nation. Do you see, in mm-hmm. terms of a market, um, where do you think that there are, is opportunity today and in, in we're recording this august 2015 well the opportunity well the value is in the eye of the beholder okay uh, opportunity exists in every market and you also have because when you say where do i see opportunity 
uh, I, the question that comes to my head is, are we talking residential? Are we talking commercial? Are we talking, you know, yeah. derivatives of real estate? What are we talking specifically? Because opportunity, is, I mean, it's everywhere. That's part of the problem. Yeah, no, I agree. And I'm, you're 100% right. Um, so let's talk about residential. Uh, cause I Got think it. that that's more, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, residential, I think people can get their head around that better than commercial or, or some kind of derivative. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, with the residential side of, of things, uh, you, again, I'm gonna go macroeconomic and that's okay. where the basis comes from is so long as, you know, the powers that be continue to print money, the population, yes, you listening to me right now, uh, unless you are holding something that is, has utility value, you're becoming poor, poorer. I can't even say it. You, your money is becoming worth less every day, every minute, every second, um, no matter how much fiat currency you're holding. So long as that's the case, when that happens, you need to be concerned about the types of uh, – when people you know, have less resources, where do they flock to for, for shelter? Because you know, as far as I know, people have always needed a place to live, work, play, or lay, and that's usually done on real estate. So I, I like apartments for that reason. Mm. Uh, I, I like the lower end of apartments for that reason because uh, – and I've seen this happen over the past few years where uh, I guess in theory our credit scores are going up because the person who used to be able to live in a little bit nicer place or nicer part of town can't because rents have increased but their wages haven't. Um, and therefore they're, they're being forced down simply because their money and their dollar doesn't go as far as it used to. Same is true when you look at, uh, you know, real estate outside of the U.S. This is why you have expats going to various other countries because simply because the dollar goes further. So you people, we tend to seek out value. Where is my dollar going to go the furthest? And, you know, what I tend to call targeted Nord or targeted Walmart style property, uh, the lower end, uh, of the spectrum is where I see the opportunities specifically uh, in apartments uh, and some sort of multi-tenant, multi-use type of thing. Okay, and and just just one clarification: you said fiat currency a, a few times. Just if that people don't know what that is, that's basically just our dollars it used to be backed by gold. Today, it's backed by nothing. It's just like the government says it's this. <laughs> you know, so if that's what fiat right. currency. Is, so okay, so so apartments. Um, is there any in terms of of uh, geography, right? I mean, where do you see? Um, you know, is it L.A.? Is it San Diego? Is it Boston? You know, Omaha, oh, Nebraska. Got it. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Now, well, uh, here's the thing: people are. I mean, last time I checked, we also like sunshine, <laughs> and so there's always going to be opportunity where there's good weather. Um, however, you should also, you know, think about you know natural resources, water. Uh, being one of them, uh, as well as natural gas and or oil, uh, where those things are, they 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 can't exactly be moved, you know, easily. So, uh, you know, Texas can be great uh, for these types of things. California, to some degree, but we have a water we're, we're dependent on other things and other places for water, so that could be a challenge. Uh, there are many places all along the eastern seaboard of the U.S. that you could you can almost pick any of them and not really go wrong. Uh, uh, simple because of their the cost of living is is appropriately priced or more appropriately priced than many other places, um, and also think about places where where food is grown. You know, the Midwest is awesome uh, for that very type of thing. Think about when you start to think about the natural things that a human being needs, where to put you know dollars in terms of real estate becomes very very obvious. And the reason, and here's the major reason why I'm saying this is because most everything else, it needs those basic things in order to exist. For example, Silicon Valley is nothing if there is no food, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and those jobs in Silicon Valley, let's be really, really clear here, uh, they could be in Singapore tomorrow with a stroke of a pen. And I'm always concerned about resource-based jobs or jobs that cannot be offshored that's what I look for uh, inside of a stable, you know, real estate market. So, you know, some states uh, of note, uh, definitely Tennessee, definitely Georgia. Um, I, I can see that North Carolina uh, being a, a decent one uh, as well. So that, but those have jobs that are not susceptible or as susceptible to other in other places to, you know, jobs being offshore overnight. 
that's really, really interesting, Jay, that you, that you take that kind of, uh, you know, look, you know, you're looking at, you know, maybe education in the market, you're looking at, uh, you know, um, level of employment in the, in a certain city or, or, or market to make some of your decisions. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, do you think for what you do, Jay, being a real estate investor, um, mm-hmm. are you an outlier in that sense or, uh, you know, are you special? <laughs> I, I I would say I, I'm special, but I would be an outlier in in two specific ways. One, um, I am one of the few African Americans that I'm aware of at this moment, uh, at and specifically at the age of forty. Uh, those are the two things that tend to make me unique when I walk into these higher level conferences. Is um, I'm one of the I don't have gray hair. <laughs> you know, um, but that's okay. That's okay. And I think we use more technology than most, but that's cool because I think it's time for real estate to catch up. I yeah. mean, I know, you know, we still use paper and all, but uh, there's other ways of getting things done. And that bridge is, it's coming. That gap is coming. And for real estate investors who are being, uh, you know, cutting edge, so to speak, if you tend to, uh, if you're paying attention, there's a really, really big gap between, you know, today's technologies, especially on the marketing side and how to bridge that with real estate. And it it can create such a massive marketing opportunity and a a business for you that you you can't even begin to imagine. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Look, you know, I'm going to ask you kind of a sensitive question, but, but, you know, you you, you kind of broached it, right? So, so you're, you're African-American, you're a black guy, right? You're not old, right? You're not a gray hair. Um, nope. but you know, if you're going to go and, and raise money, you're typically going to raise it from old, old white men, you know, that, that listen to Rush Limbaugh, right? I mean, is that ever a challenge? Awesome. All the time, all the time. Um, but, but here's the thing. And even more so in commercial real estate, and it's very, very discouraging and frustrating that this is the state, but you know, whatever it is, what we, we deal with what we deal with. Um, because no one ever assumes I'm the owner. No one ever assumes I'm the syndicator, the promoter, the head guy. They, they never, ever assume. It. And especially in this is, it's actually kind of fun at sometimes because I can go undercover on my own properties and none of the tenants will ever think that I'm the owner. They just don't because I, well, they just don't. So, um, at the end of the day though, it's not about me. It, the marketplace is blind. I've learned that. Uh, if you can provide value, it doesn't care. Uh, and it's, it was never about me. It's never about you. It's, it's about the team behind us. And the team is, is what truly uh, ultimately matters is, you know, the management team, the, the rehab team, the, the, who's, the, who's on the team, you know, who's playing ball. And those things are important. And if you can work with individuals who can see past you know, the surface, then great. Uh, if you can't, then great. The cool thing is, like I said, there's an oversupply of money uh, in the, the system. So there, there's not a shortage of dollars or people for us to work with. Uh, now, there, there can be a shortage of open minds, but not a shortage of yeah. money. Okay. No, that's good. That's a good answer. Um, what do you, and, and we, let me look at the time. Okay. We're okay. Um, we're going to start wrapping up here, Jay, but what do you think? I mean, we're in, you know, if I look at the real estate market today, uh, and, and, and again, we buy radio across the nation. So I'm really familiar with, you know, from Florida to, to San Diego. Um, sure. We are in an environment very similar, I think, to what we saw back in 05, 06, right? This is Greenspan's irrational exuberance. I mean, you know, inventory is really, really hard. Um, what do you think is going to happen? The, you know, the Fed's going to raise rates. There's no doubt about it. Okay, right? It's, it's not if, but when. What is the real estate market going to look like to a real estate agent selling houses as well as to a real estate investor like you when rates do go up? Well, um, those who have been betting on anything other than cash flow are going to have a problem. Uh, so that that's going to be a challenge. And as far as agents go, I would encourage them to strongly find and learn how to do transactions with buyers and sellers that don't involve a bank at all. That's what I would encourage them strongly to do because right now uh, you, you're the business is dependent upon the integrity of the financial system. You lose that you're you, there's going to be no commission. (laughs) So you're going to have to figure out how to operate 
uh, in that uh, alternative environment. And that's one of the things that we've already done. You know, as of now, uh, we still have not closed any loans with a bank. You know, we've done tens of millions of dollars of real estate, varying levels of, you know, anywhere from, like I said, single family houses, cell phone towers, 182 unit apartment buildings, no bank loans. And you're going to need to know how to help buyers and sellers still transact business in that high inflation or higher interest rate environment where they're not going to want to. And there's going to be this insane amount of capital on the sidelines seeking some of that higher interest as well. So you you should begin to build uh, these databases. If you're going to be that realtor or that investor, you should begin to build these databases of uh, individuals who have you know, uh, capital that they now need to get those high interest rates on or higher interest rates on in some way, shape, or form, or they're going to chase uh, what I call utility value. Because at the end of the day, that's the one thing that we have that trumps, you know, uh, all uh, nearly every other form of investment. We have utility value. I don't care how great, you know, Coke is, Coca-Cola does their you know, thing, but you know what? They can't do it without a piece of real estate that to perform their functions on it, to house their workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have utility value, and I can always trade my real estate for anything else, the, just the use of my real estate for anything else that I need. Got it. Man, that's good, man. You are good, buddy. Um, I, I, would love to, I would love to dig into where you got your education. I kind of asked it earlier, but but you, okay, what you said, Jay, you said, hey, listen, if you're, if you're playing the game with anything other than cash flow, when rates go up, you're going to get in trouble. Now, we yeah. all know that, you know, again, like going back to 02, you could buy anything you bought. Didn't matter because six months from now, that, that, that property is going to be worth more. You, you know, people were buying for appreciation. Um, now, sure. when you look at a deal, it, it, how, and this is just really for me, Jay, are you, is it all about cash flow or, or in your equation, in your model, how much um, power or weight do you give the you know, appreciation over the five or seven year hold that you're going to hold it? Got it. Um, and I, for that very purpose, and I, this is one of the things I described and explained in my book. Um, is the what I, I developed a model called the profit analysis quadrant. It's just designed to take any business and real estate and put it on this simple quadrant that tells you where the profit is, so you can assign a proper weight as you as you put it to to understand what needs to happen. Now, what you're talking about is what I call quadrant one, uh, which is in appreciation. So when there's you know four different areas of profit between appreciation, depreciation, amortization, and cash flow, but we're talking about quadrant one right now. Inside of appreciation, though, uh, and that's the thing, many people use it as a very general term. I break it down, and I, I was taught to break it down, and I like it broken down into five different areas because there's five different types. There's found, forced, phased, inflated, and passive appreciation. So um, I'll cover the last two, the inflated and passive appreciation. So the inflated appreciation is, you know, it's just related to Janet Yellen or whomever's at the helm printing more money. Uh, the passive appreciation is what you've seen, we've all seen. Hey, this area of town is hot, and so everybody pays $30,000 more. Why? I don't know. They just do. Okay, I have no control over those two. So those get absolutely zero credit uh, as far as I'm concerned. I don't care how long you can prove it on a historical chart. They get absolutely zero credit. The only three forms of appreciation that I give any credence to is, like I said, found, forced, and phased. Found being 100% dependent upon my ability to negotiate uh, a deal in today's present value dollars that is better than the actual market price, also known as a discount. That's what found appreciation is. It's uh, for to use an example in my book. I, I gave, uh, I bought a 70 unit building, and you don't even know where the you don't even need to know where this is to know that this was a decent negotiation. I bought a 71 unit building for sixty thousand dollars. Okay. But how many no units? No, seventy-one. <laughs> and it, see, that's my point. You don't need to know where it uh, is. You just need to know that it was standing. That yes, it, it it had a roof. I mean, it was a real building. Okay. But my point is, you know that I, you know, there was more value there than the sixty thousand dollars, and that's what I'm talking about. So that's not, that's what I mean by found. Forced. This is what the television shows are all about, and this is what everybody sees. This is the 
uh, fix and flip, the flip that and the flip this, and and you just go in and you put and you make it better. You improve what was there. You just put it back to functional use. You update the kitchen and the cabinets and blah 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 blah. That's you know everyone sees that you get that one that one TV. The fun one is phase depreciation. Builders are hyper familiar with this. This is where you take a vacant, you know, vacant lot, vacant plot of land, you begin to subdivide it, then you start to building the model home and you build phase one, phase two, phase three. That's one way of looking at it. Another way I like to look at it is, especially with an apartment building, um, you, you take you take that apartment building and you add something to it. Maybe it's a cell phone tower. Maybe it's a billboard. Maybe if you have a blank wall that faces a freeway, that becomes advertising space. All of these things add additional value and, and increase the, the value of that property. So if it's one of those three, found, forced, or phased, I'll give it some credit for sure. But if you're just talking about, hey, the marketplace is going to be hot or you know they're going to print more money, I don't give that any credit. That gets an absolute goose egg uh, 100% of the time. Okay. Yeah, and uh, as it should. It should have no value. And I, and I think one quick thing I want to point out is guys like you, you know, some people think, and this, this ties into the, to what you just said, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, when I sell, this is how much money I'm going to make. And, and guys like you, you make money when you buy it. You know how you, yeah. you make money when you buy it, not when you sell it. Um, all right, Jay, look. Uh, fascinating conversation, fascinating guy. I always ask for a book recommendation. Now, here's the typical setup that I use, and you can answer it in any way, so don't, 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 don't let me pigeonhole you here. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book do I need to go buy today? Mine. Okay. <laughs> and I'm, let me tell you why I say that, because I actually normally don't even give my book as the recommendation, but you said $25 meant limited resources. You need to learn how to generate leads, get out there, get interest, and make these things happen, and that's exactly how we started. You know, My wife and I, we were squatting a bank on property. She had a medical condition and was unable to eat or drink, and I had a medical condition and was unable to walk and talk. Oh my that's God. cold for... That's how we started our real estate career. So I didn't have the ability to go spend a ton of money on marketing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to figure out how to do this without that, that backing. And that's what I put in the book. I, you know, it's 10 steps to creating wealth in any economy. It's like, here's what you need to do so that you can go out there and do some of these things too. Uh, I got it now. And so if, and, and again, so um, I'm looking at it right now. The name of your book, is it just Cashflow Diary? Yeah, okay. it's very simple. The screen. name of the book is Cashflow Diary. In fact, if it's okay, I, if, if you're open to it, I can give you a link that uh, give them an electronic copy at no cost. Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm going to read it. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For those of you listening, if you're traveling on a mobile device, just send a text message to 72000. The keyword is book, B-O-O-K. B O O K to seventy two thousand seven two zero zero zero. For those of you uh, outside of the U.S. or not near a mobile device, just go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Put in your details, and I'll email it straight on over to you. You can begin reading and learning all about it today. That is really cool, Jay. I really appreciate you doing that. Well, listen, I always encourage my audience, if they've gotten anything out of this, to reach out and say thank you for you, uh, for, you, know, for you taking the time out. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, where can people find out more about you and, uh, and reach out and say thank you? Sure. Uh, I always welcome as many podcast reviews as you'd like uh, over at CashflowDiaryPodcast.com. And we have a little over 200 episodes now uh, of interviews with entrepreneurs of all kinds who are out there producing cash flows using, yes, real estate, but also many other different things. You can also catch us uh, just going to the blog at CashflowDiary.com. And I am easily found on every social media platform just by searching for Cashflow Diary. Awesome. And just for the record, guys, I've been on the show, and in the, uh, in the show notes, yep. I will include uh, this, this link uh, that you need to use for your mobile device, and I'll include the link to, to my episode with Jay. Hey, Jay, yes. I'll be the first one, man, to kick off the thank you train. I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. Thank you. You're quite welcome. I like the thank you train. That's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, buddy. Let's keep in touch. All right. See you, Talk Let's go. Yeah. For those of you that want to know what we're all about, it's like this, y'all. This is 10% luck, 20% skill, 
100%. 